All right, so Bitcoin's over 60,000. Chris, I'm assuming you can retire now because you must have put your life savings in that back when it was you know, trading somewhere around like 10,000. So I'm only guessing at this point you're independently wealthy. You know, right at, at this rate, it's like a week by week thing for the, you know, one week I'm retired, the next week, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, eating crackers, but you know, hey, <laughs> nothing ventured, nothing gained. But you know, it's funny. I was talking to a client of mine uh, this week. I was doing an annual review and uh, one of the things he was really excited to talk to me. He's like, Chris, guess what? He's like, my Bitcoin's up. I'm almost to the point of where I paid for it. Wow. Wow. You must have really overpaid for it. Well, I have to guess most people probably bought Bitcoin in the 50s, right? Like around 50,000. So it's not like, I mean, I know there's people out there that bought it when it was way, way lower. But uh, but the reality of it is everyone usually gets in when something's super hot. So probably most people aren't up that much on their cost basis. They even held it. But man, I think this what this really speaks to in my mind is if Bitcoin's going up like this, there's a lot of speculation out there. Things are getting wild. Well, it's all about liquidity, guys. I mean, it's the same thing that drove the the tech bubble in the in 90s. You know, you had a big liquidity event. The, you know, the economy was flush with cash. And that's why you see this momentum trade. You got this, uh, you got a liquidity momentum chasing market right now. You know, whether it's Bitcoin or, you know, a semiconductor stock or, or Snowflake. Well, that's actually down 20% today, but 395 times earnings. I mean, come on, how can it be a bad deal? Yeah. But, you know, we know it can get crazier, right? I mean, if you look sure. at the amount of money sitting in cash right now, money market funds still at $6 trillion. Uh, we, you know, we've used that stat a lot on this show, but that just makes me think about, like, when is that money coming into the market? It's not at NIF, it's when. And we know where that money is going to go. It's going to follow the momentum. So momentum is just going to be on top of momentum. And then we know analysts will keep raising their estimates based on how high stocks go. So they'll they'll fuel the fire even further. And when the music stops nobody's going to tell you ahead of time. I think that's the big lesson here that you probably should learn. But I guess, yeah, you know, here's what I can't figure out. Are we at 1994, you know, where the market just went off on a tear, you know, for six years? Or we had 1999 where, it, uh, you know, we had a melt up so quick. And I'll tell you what, meltdowns are no fun. Um, and I, you know, I just, that if, if somebody thinks they can time this, you know, bless them. I don't, I don't know that you can. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how you how you time a momentum trade. Well, what are you talking about? If it goes down a little bit, that's when I sell. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Those I'm... close stops and the, you know those yeah. those floor traders aren't going to take you out, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, that's the problem, right? Is the industry is just going to keep you on the fire, um, and when the tide goes out, everyone's going to be swimming naked. <laughs> you know, yeah. all the all the experts on Wall Street are going to be swimming naked. Um, no one's going to be able to predict it ahead of time. And I think it goes back to one of our ethos. A paying capital, and that is, it's not about making all the money in a bull market. It's about losing less in a down market. That's what really determines performance over time. And we all forget that. We forget how horrific it feels when markets go down and how cruel and how quickly they go down. And when emotions get you know, the way they are now, the animal, animal spirits are out, people are feeling good. It's so easy to get lost in the intoxication of this big booming bull market. But man, oh man, we know the other side of that coin. And you have to remind yourself of that because this ain't going to last forever. You know, right? That's a really great point, actually. Dad, I don't know if you remember it back in, I think it was in like the mid 2000s, E Trade came out with this brilliant commercial. It was a guy watching replays of the stock market record highs on his VHF. And he's sitting there with a box of tissues crying because <laughs> the market <laughs> was in the toilet again. Yeah. I'm forgetting one of the best cartoons I ever saw in the Wall Street Journal way a long time ago, um, maybe in the 80s, even or 90s. And there's a gentleman sitting at his easy chair reading the Wall Street Journal. And then the quote balloon comes up, says, you know, should I put all my money in the market and cause it to crash? Or should I just sit here and let it run away without me? You know, and it's just, it, it never changes. Um, and, you know, just before we started the podcast today, they had a bunch of analysts on, strategists on. Like, clearly, they've been so bearish for so long. And now they're acting like, oh, yeah, well, you know, we were in all the time. Um, but- you know, it, 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 that's how crazy it is. They're trying to predict things that can't be predicted. But meanwhile, we just had 93% of companies that reported earnings. They came in really good. GDP now is predicting a 3% GDP number for the quarter. We had a, a great quarter last quarter. Uh, you know, you're looking at the earnings estimates. You know, everybody's starting to look past 2024. Now we're looking at 2025. You know, we're starting to pay attention to those. 
And even 2026 looks good. So the outlook's really, really kind of positive, very positive right now. It is, but you got to make the right decision here, right? And the right decision is not going to be instant gratification, unfortunately. And I, I kind of like, Bob, the thing about analysts, uh, they, they have the uh, shortest term memory <laughs> of, of uh, anyone in the world because it's right. They just like, it's like all of a sudden, it's like a real, reality distortion field. They can't even remember telling you about how dire the economy was and how dire the earnings, uh, you know, projections were going to be. And now all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah, you know, I told you being all along. Um, it's annoying, but I digress. But I think, you know, bottom line here is you're right. Right now, if you look at outside of tech, outside of AI, outside of these magnificent bubbles building in the crypto space is companies in general are trading relatively cheap, especially if you look overseas. You're getting great dividends right now. And you start looking at the earnings picture, small caps are going to start outpacing large caps next year in terms of earning growth based on projection. So there's so many great places to put your money. It's probably just not going to work right away, but that's where good investing comes in. It's right. Sitting on something patiently and then bam, at some point it's going to work, but you want to be there beforehand. And right now you have that opportunity. Well, that's what always made it so interesting and fascinating for me, guys, is I always said that Wall Street is loaded with ordinary people promising to do extraordinary things. Um, And, you know, analysts are just Everyday, normal, ordinary people. So they follow companies that they like, right? They're with, they thought the company was going to go under. It was going to be horrible. You know, they'd move to a different industry group. So they kind of fall in love with their company. And then, you know, the company plays that game. If things are really good, they kind of downplay the upcoming quarter, right? Um, and so, oh, we got surprised to the upside. I mean, how many quarters have we spoke about, guys, of the last two or three years where the surprises were to the upside? So if yeah. they see a recession coming or starting to feel it, you know, they'll they'll hint that, you know, towards the analyst, but it, it, it's such an interesting game that all these, you know, these finance guys play, you know, what in the C-suite, you know, oh yeah, we're going to, things are going to be okay. Oh, surprise. We blew out the quarter. Look at the stock go up. Oh, by the way, I get compensated on stock. It, isn't that, it's interesting how that works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is a total game. And the problem is, right, that, that works really well when you're not in a recession, which I don't think we are right now. But the problem is when those, you know, when the real recession's about to come and those earnings are start to fall off a cliff, there's no heads up. <laughs> the analysts, just like they were late to raise their earnings, like no analyst could figure out that NVIDIA was going to have these astronomical quarters. You know, they were way behind the eight ball on that. It's going to be the same thing when earnings finally slow down. They're going to be well behind the eight ball again. So it has no value, um, which I know it's kind of cruel to say that, but it's true. You know, if, if anyone really knew and they had that crystal ball, they could really see into the future. They'd be on their yacht. They wouldn't be working as an analyst for a bank. I got to tell you. Hey, Ryan, what's your problem with NVIDIA? It's the number three holding in our large cap growth fund. I love NVIDIA. Hey, I love it too. Um, And more goes up, the better. But the problem is, like Cisco in the late 90s, early 2000s, at some point, that party's going to end. And unfortunately, we're not going to know ahead of time. I'm sorry. Well, we will because it's going to play out the same way. You guys don't remember the 90s. They had uh, perfectly allocated portfolios. Everybody was set for life. Goals were met. And then it's like, you know, Bob, uh, I don't really like bonds anymore. You know, bonds are kind of boring. You know, there's 5 6% tax-free municipal bonds. Let's get rid of those. I want to be all stock. And then it's, you know, that diversified equity portfolio, I don't really like that anymore. I, I like large cap growth. You know, let's go all large cap growth. And then now that you, I, hey, you know what? That large cap growth fund's okay, but I really like Microsoft, Intel, and Cisco. Let's just get down to those three stocks, right? The will tell trade uh, was what we called it. And then it's like, you know what? Those That Intel's a dog. Let's put it all in Cisco. I mean, at 200 times forward earnings, what could go wrong? And then boom, <laughs> then it's over. <laughs> a lot can go wrong, right? That stock has still not gotten back to its high from 2000. I know, it's amazing. Yeah. And I think the funny thing is nobody knew what Cisco did. <laughs> I like, bet you not most people most people don't know what NVIDIA does, right? It's like it's the same thing. And I, I think the the problem here is just that, right? And we're already starting to see that. I've seen a couple investors say, Well, I'm not really impressed with these municipal bonds that paid five percent last year. Right. I'm like, that's an amazing return for a very safe asset. Um, but meanwhile, my S P five hundred fund was up over twenty percent. And I sure. think that's where the mistake's going to come in here is, is people are going to start to abandon their asset allocation. They're going to lose that discipline. And man, oh man, when that music stops, um, they're going to really wish they kept to that discipline. But it's so hard. The seduction 
of a bull market is very, very dangerous. Well, I said to a client of mine the other day, you know, they were talking about not in love with their bond portfolio and wanting to own, you know, more of the Magnificent Six. I said, okay. I said, well, today we're going to do a guided meditation. I'm going to take you <laughs> back to a time in 2020 and in 2008, and I want you to remember how you felt. I said, and then I want you to come tell me in a couple of days if you still want to buy those stocks. Well, you know, Chris, I, I agree with you. That's perfect because, you know, you go back and it's funny when folks ask you, Bob, when did you and Ryan start paying capital? Uh, 2008. Oh, wow. It was a horrible time. And you know, remember, you, you, I, you know, remember how risk adverse people were? The, the average portfolio was underweighted equities um, back in 2008. Matter of fact, they're underweight the U.S. stock market. And now you fast forward, you know, 2024. Now everybody's like, well, who cares about risk? You know, risk is, uh, what the heck? It goes down, it comes back. You know, people have more, um, a heavier weighting now in their equity portfolio than I think any time since 1999. Well, Bob and Chris, just to wrap things up here, we'll go to the great sage of investing, Warren Buffett, who once said, be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. And man, oh man, right now is a perfect time to be very, very fearful because greed is real. It's out there and might only get worse. You know, I'll tell you what, I think um, Warren Buffett um, is going to get a message from the grave from Charlie Munger. He's going, what are you doing? Half our portfolios, Dow Apple, what kind of asset allocated strategy is that? You know, you're making a big bet on one company. I think Charlie would be very disappointed in the uh, Oracle of Omaha right now. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 151, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you want a more hands-on approach, you want to make sure you're doing everything right for your financial independence plan, and you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence, Bob, Chris, and I will run for you our total financial master plan. We'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We literally look at everything. There's not a firm out there that will do this work up front. We go as far as building you, your own personalized financial portal. We'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and we'll hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. Whether it's an income plan for retirement, the best way to take Social Security, how do you draw from your portfolio without running out of money factoring inflation? We'll build that dynamic income plan so you don't run out of money. We'll look at diversification. Has your portfolio been wild the last two, three years all over the place like a yo-yo? Or have you been sitting with way too much money in cash? Paralysis by analysis, can't figure out what to do. We'll put together a full investment game plan. We'll show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, mutual fund, brokerage product, structured product. We'll do a deep dive of every investment you own. We'll show you how to reduce the cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's now what you make. It's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook. If you saved over a million dollars and you want that full review, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E. Having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And Bob and Chris, you know, when it comes to financial planning and investing, and you take our collective 75 years, we know that a lot of you can be your worst enemy when it comes to making financial decisions. So I thought we could just talk about some of the bigger mistakes we make when we get in our own way and we're our worst enemy when it comes to making good, sound decisions when it comes to your money. You know, I'll tell you guys, one of the, one of the th awful truths is that, uh, you know, the only thing guaranteed in life is death and taxes. And I, I remember doing my own personal wealth projection you know, way back as a rookie broker in my days at Mother Merrill. And, you know, I'm thinking, well, my tax bracket's going to be a lot lower, you know, once I retire. Um, but you never thought about, you know, having millions of dollars in your 401k that you have to pay tax on, right? That would push you into a higher marginal bracket. Uh, but, you know, and you just don't know what tax bracket's going to be. My goodness, when I started, you know, we had a 90% marginal tax rate at one time. Yeah. You know, talk about the uh, the federal government confiscating your, your hard-earned income. But uh, so you, you always have to deal with what you know as opposed to pretending that you can predict the future when it comes to inflation or taxes, savings, or spend. Well, I think it goes back to our favorite adage, right? Money saved in taxes is just as great as any money you can make in your investments. And I think that's where most of us spend the least amount of time thinking about, right? We know annuities love to be sold talking about like 
income for life, guaranteed 10% return, which we know is not real. But when you start taking that money, you're paying it at the highest tax bracket, right? So it's extremely tax inefficient, yet most of us don't take the time to really look at what actually is in our pocket after the tax man has got a hold of your gains and your income and your dividends. I heard about somebody once say that your individual retirement account is actually a joint account and the joint partner is the U.S. government because <laughs> you could basically assume they're going to take 40% to half over time. Well, it goes back to what I was saying earlier on the show, like last year, a muni portfolio returned 5%. If you live in New York or any other states that have huge taxes or you're just in a high marginal bracket, that's like you getting 7% on a equivalent pre-tax basis, right? In an investment that pays income and matures. So it's just so important to understand those tax implications because again, maybe you get a high return on something, but if you're paying a ton in taxes on it, it might be a very low return after the tax man gets their way with you. Yeah, that's absolutely the case. And it's um, and your money compounds much faster when you're paying less to the IRS or the state of New York and New Jersey or, or Illinois. So it's it's really critical to make sure you maintain you know a low a low tax profile. Um, one of my buddies from home, Rye, saw you on um, one of the TV shows the other day, and he said, "Oh my goodness, Bob, I'm sitting here thinking I got five percent return on my cash at the local bank, and after listening to Ryan, I'm not making anything after taxes and inflation. So <laughs> you got a you got a big fat check coming your way for our municipal bond portfolio because it makes so much sense, you know, after listening to what you keep as opposed to what coupon is or what the interest rate is. And it's simple math, right? If you're getting 5%, but inflation's 3%, you're down to 2% and you still have to pay taxes on that. You're down to closer to maybe a 1% return. When you factor in taxes and inflation, that money market fund of 5% doesn't sound so great anymore. And yes, on a treasury money market fund, you do pay federal tax, by the way. It's a lot of money. Well, you know, I tell you what, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but we have a presidential election coming up in November. And and I am telling you, I am just dreading it because, you know, four years ago, every single client was trying to gain the election. Well, if this side gets in, the market will do X. The other side gets in, the market will do Y. Let's put money in cash and time this. Um, you can't predict the outcome of an election, nor can you predict what the outcome is going to be on the outcome that you predict. So it's just it's, it's amazing how much volatility we're going to experience between now and Election Day. And I guarantee you one thing, the day after the election, all the noise will turn off and you'll start hearing about something else. Well, it certainly happened last time. And I had a bunch of clients uh, call me prior to the election to say, if so-and-so gets in, I want to get out. And uh, <laughs> you, know what, you know what happened the very next day after the election? The market went straight up last time. Yeah. Whether you love Joe Biden or don't love Joe Biden, the market did go straight up after he was elected. And I think it was just the certainty that you knew you had a president <laughs> that was more important than if his policies were good or bad. I mean, you've said this before, and I think there's another Warren Buffett quote, we'll use the Oracle of Omaha today, is it's it's about a beauty contest, right? It's not about what you think is beauty. It's about what the actual judge thinks beauty is. So you have no idea how markets are going to react to any sort of data ahead of time. So it's not worth trying to figure that out. More important to figure out what your goals are. It's not about a cataclysmic event affecting your portfolio or an all or none proposition. It doesn't work that way. Well, I think as an investor, you should always be happy. You should be happy when the market's going down because then you can invest when the market's low. And you should be happy when the market's up because you're making money. Either way, the outcome's always going to be better. I think that really comes down, and I'm a basic guy, right? So I look at things from a very- We know, Bob. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, just very fundamental thinker. And who ends up running these big companies, right? Versus who goes into politics? And it's you know, these really bright people that, you know, get paid huge money to be in the C-suite, they only get paid huge money if the earnings go up. So, you know, they're watching the election. They don't care who gets in. They just want to see, OK, what do I have to do now to get around whatever they're going to pass? And it's amazing, right? These companies, they continue to grow, right? You look at the earnings that uh, we're having right now. The earnings that this country generates are the largest in history. They're estimated to be larger next year, larger the following year. And the last I le looked, guys, stocks are the slaves of earning power. And so, you know, they're watching the election just to see what they have to do to keep growing the company so your stocks will go up. Yeah. Well, you know, Ryan, as the uh, president of our firm, I'm really kind of curious to see who you're going to vote for. Never count me out and never bet against American business, I think, is, is probably a good adage there. Um, but I think right now, you know, it's really important, too, we talked about this 
a lot is just you've got to really stick to your knitting right now, right? Because there is greed in the air. The reason Bitcoin's over 60,000, there's a lot of liquidity out there. And there's a lot of seduction to put your money in one place like AI or growth stocks or tech stocks. But we know everything's cyclical. And if you're building your portfolio for retirement, you can't get seduced into the greed of the moment. It's the worst thing you can do for your retirement plan. You've got to stick to your discipline. And if you're getting close to retirement, you have to think about income. Income's way more consistent. It's not predicated on if NVIDIA's earnings are going to be amazing next quarter or not. So you really got to start to transition your portfolio as you're getting closer to living off your portfolio, going from that wealth accumulation to what we call that wealth distribution stage. And I can tell you with all the portfolios we look at, most of you haven't made that change and it's going to come back to bite you. And you know what, later on, if you don't make those adjustments proactively. Well, I think you don't want to be in a competition, right? It's, you know, you don't need to beat the market. The market has generated, all financial markets have generated, you know, a very generous return, enough return for everyone to achieve their goals. And it just blows my mind. And as I told you guys this week, I got an email from our friends at home. I used to belong in my country club, just pleaded to financial fraud because, you know, he was involved in a $515 million scam. And, you know, why do people give money to these people? You know, they promise them 10 to 14% returns. And you hear 10% yeah. in a 4% market, you got, you know, you just, you're greedy, you know? So it's just, it's just a shame that people fall for these things. It makes it harder for everybody, but you don't have to reach for return. Just that's always the one thing you got to remember, accept the returns. The thing you have to ask yourself is, number one, what return do I need to keep my lifestyle intact, right? Am I taking too much risk to get that return or not enough risk to get that return? That's all that matters. If you're getting a return that you need, it's more important than what your friend at the cocktail party is getting on their portfolio. You got to customize it for yourself. You almost have to look at it in a vacuum, but it's all about what your needs are, what your goals are, managing the risk, getting the right return so you can live comfortably, period. All right, it's the hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, after peaking at 7,378 stocks in 1998, the Wilshire 5000 Index had 3,392 names as of January 31st, a lot less than it used to. The number of stocks in the index has been shrinking because mergers, takeovers, and leveraged buyouts have taken more companies from the public markets then initial public offerings have spin and spinoffs have added to it. So the stock market is shrinking, Bob. That's crazy. Yeah, well, it's been going on for a while, Rye, and I love it because, you know, when you have that scarcity, it makes the existing companies even more valuable. Last year wasn't a big year for M&A, but this year it's taken off. It's almost tripled size already, uh, at least on estimated deals. But here's the thing that drives me crazy. These private equity firms that go out there and they buy publicly companies, they take them private, then they slap 2 to 4% expenses on it and try and sell it back to you. Um, you know, it's like you got all the return you need in the companies that are still traded publicly. Stick with the public markets, I always say. I like it, Bob. Nothing more liquid, more exciting than uh, public markets in the good old USA. <laughs> Chris, just a reminder that long-term investing is good. The value of all stocks traded in the U.S. rose fivefold during the 1990s when Bob was driving a Jaguar from $4 trillion to $20 trillion and now it's up another fourfold to above $80 trillion. That's crazy to think that it was like $4 trillion, Dad, when you were in the business in the 90s. Now it's at $80 trillion. Man, guys, that's a lot of growth. As Bob always says, it's about time in the market, not timing in the market. And investing, just like eating, you should do it daily. There you go. I like it. it. And don't put it all into Bitcoin. <laughs> so, but then again, I don't look so smart today. So we'll have to see how that plays out. All right, but I think this is a really interesting stat, but this also talks about how crazy liquidity is right now. But this company, Super Microcomputer, which sounds like a fake company, uh, they manufacture computers that companies use as servers for websites, data storage, applications, such as, no surprise, AI. It's in the AI craze. Stock's up 180% this year. But what's wild is the company was able to raise funds via what you call convertible note for $1.5 billion at zero borrowing cost, which basically means they're borrowing that money for zero and the stock has to go up like another 37, 38% before you can convert it to stock. That's insane. They could take that $1.5 billion today and just invest it into a 5% treasury, which would pay 75 million a year. 
When you're getting zero financing like that, you know things are crazy. Hey, it just shows you that super microcomputer is much smarter than the federal government. They're going to borrow at 5%. These guys are borrowing at zero. Geniuses. You know, I, I love it. I'm not giving them any of my money, but I sure love the way they work. Financial engineering. It's, it's good for the company, not great for the investor, I'm going to guess, over time. But things are crazy out there. They could get crazier. Hope you enjoyed episode 151, Pain Points of Wealth. If you like our podcast, love our podcast, please give us that five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. You can leave a comment there telling everyone how great we are. Or you can go to Spotify. You can subscribe there. If you're watching this on YouTube, please give us a like. You can subscribe to our channel. And you can click that little notification bell to be updated every week of all our new content. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind.